the session is also being recorded. Just need to notify everybody that this is it's not being live streamed, but it is being recorded and it will be posted to YouTube for later distribution. So thank you. Right, welcome there. everyone. And thank you for coming. My name is Derek and I am excited to be presenting our work on computational modeling of the terminal center response using CompuCell 3D. Um, I will first give a quick overview of the biological background of the terminal center response. And then I will demonstrate the computational simulation with a walkthrough of the code. I will also talk about how we exported and visualized the data from our simulation. And finally, if time permits, um, there will be some exercises for everyone to do in terms of plotting the simulation outputs. So before I dive into the code, I will first provide a brief explanation of the biological processes of germinal center responses and why they are so important to our immune systems. I'm sure many are familiar with this concept already, but there are two main aspects of the human immune human immune system, with the first being innate immunity. And these innate defenses include external defenses like the skin, and they serve as a first line of defense. The second line of defense is the adaptive immunity, which involves immune cells targeting specific antigens using antibodies. And the majority of defenses against pathogens, such as viruses like COVID, come from adaptive, come from adaptive immunity. And now specific to adaptive immunity, there may be T cell independent or T cell dependent um, humoral immune responses. Of these two, T cell dependent responses are the ones that produce memory B cells and a long lived response. So, T cell dependent humoral immune responses take place in germinal centers, which is where B cells undergo maturation. B cells produced in GCRs are affinity matured and exit the germinal center as long-lived memory B cells or high affinity antibody secreting plasma cells. These memory B cells are especially important during secondary exposure to the same antigen because they can be recalled quickly to proliferate and produce more plasma cells. So now let's take a look at the structure of the germinal centers, which is the location where GCRs occur. So germinal centers are specialized microstructures that form in B cell follicles of secondary lymphoid tissues in response to infection or immunization. For a typical secondary immune organ like the lymph node seen on the left, the GCR occurs in the secondary follicles in the outer cortex, where the inner cortex is a T cell zone. And now zooming in on this figure, it can be seen that the germinal center is round shaped, but it can also be separated into two distinct zones, dark and light, which are shaped like waxing moons and waning moons respectively. And of these two zones, the dark zone is more populated and is packed with proliferating B cells, and the light zone is less populated with non-proliferating B cells. So in the GCR, B cells travel back and forth between the dark and the light zones by the chemotrack ingredients CXCL12 and CXCL13. Newly activated B cells start in the dark zone of the germinal center on the left. And in the dark zone, the B cells undergo proliferation by clonal expansion, uh, somatic hypermutation, and class switch recombination, which is just to change the isotype of their BCR from IgM to IgG or IgA or IgE. And the B cells then follow the, C the CXCL13 chemotracting gradient to the light zone on the right, where they undergo a process of positive selection. So these B cells in the light zone, they first capture antigen presented on follicular dendritic cells or FDCs, and then they are filtered by T follicular helper cells such that low affinity variants are, eliminate, are eliminated by apoptosis. And then in this way, only the high affinity variants can survive and they return back to the drug zone to repeat the process of um, proliferation and mutation. After many rounds of proliferation and somatic hypermutation, these affinity mature B cells then exit the germinal center as um, high affinity cells and they differentiate into memory B cells or long-lived plasma cells. And essentially the purpose of our program is just to simulate the B cells activity during GCRs, which I just went over, and how environmental chemicals can disrupt the, can disrupt the response. And the end, goal, the end goal of our model is just to help us better understand and predict 
the health risks of environmental immunotoxicants on GCRs. The gene network involved in the GCR is pretty complex and involves numerous different pathways as can be seen in this figure on the top left. So we decided to simplify the network into the one seen on the right with um, CXCR4 controlling the migration of B cells in response to the gradients of chemotractins CXCL12 and 13, MYC and AP4 signaling um, controlling B cell proliferation, uh, MHC2 signaling between B and T cells, FOXO1 signaling between B cells and FDC, and NF kappa B signaling between B cells and CRCs. And then this simplified intracellular network was then modeled using tellurium, which I will talk more about later. So there are currently four main aspects to the simulation. The first is modeling major participating cell types, including B cells, uh, follicular dendritic cells in the light zone, CXCL12 expressing reticular cells or CRCs in the dark zone, and T follicular helper cells in the light zone. And on the right, we have the corresponding XML code uh, with the cell types. The second is B cell chemotaxis, which is dictated by the chemo tracking gradients CXCL12 and 13 and express receptors. And the third key aspect is light zone B cell interactions, including B cells capturing antigen presented by FDCs and positive selection by T cells. And finally, in the dark zone, um, we have B cells proliferating and undergoing somatic hypermutation. So before I talk more about my code, I'm going to first show everyone a video of the simulation so that it is easier to understand. So on the left, we have CRCs seated in the dark zone. And then on the right, we have T cells and FDCs in the light zone. And these irregular shaped cells in the um, middle and near the dark zone right now are B cells and their colors represent their affinity score, which is basically their ability to neutralize antigens. And so a higher affinity score will be um, warmer in color, will be red. And basically these cells right now are pretty low affinity. So as they move, move back and forth between the dark and light zones, you can see them mutating and proliferating in the dark zone. And gradually their affinity scores also start to increase. And so if I skip to the uh, end of the video, it can, be see that, it can be seen that one, there are a lot more cells and two, nearly all their colors are red, which denotes a super high affinity, which means that they're very good at neutralizing the antigens. And we will come back to this video later after I finish going over the code. So five files were used. First was a main Python script for running the simulation. Second was an XML script for initializing the simulation parameters. Third was a Python script for the code itself. And fourth was a PIF file, which was used to set up the simulation. And finally, there was a separate Python script outside of CompuCell 3D for exporting and processing data. The model was implemented in CompuCell 3D and using the simulation wizard, we decided to set, we decided to set up a 100 by 100 2D plane um, as the boundaries for the germinal center. A PIF file was used to create the, the surrounding wall, which restricted the B cells to a 100 by 100 area in the plane. And the reason why we included this wall was because originally the B cells would get stuck to the edges of the plane when we ran the simulation. And this wall around the um, 100 by 100 area would help prevent this because we could increase the B cell to wall energy, energy values, um, and this would prevent the stickiness. So in, or in order to model all the major participating cell types, some cells needed to be seeded in the dark and light zones. And this was done in the Python code. 
CRC were randomly generated in the dark zone by picking random values within an ellipse centered in the dark zone. FTC and T cells were randomly generated in the light zone using the same method. And here is just the um, ellipse equation and this for loop indicates that there were 18 CRCs generated. So in order to generate the B cells, there was an extra step that had to be taken, which was to make each B cell unique in their ability to neutralize antigens. In order to do this, a arbitrary target sequence was initialized as AGTCT, and it represented the sequence that most effectively neutralizes the antigens presented by the FTCs. Next, um, five ran random five-digit sequences, five of them as shown by this for loop, were then chosen and stored into a list to be later assigned to B cells. I guess now would be a good time to mention that B cells with a sequence identical to the target sequence would have a perfect affinity score of five, and a sequence that is one letter off, um, or AGTCG instead of AGTCT, for example, would only have a score of four, and so on and so forth. Now B cells could be randomly generated near the center of the plane. So these B cells were then assigned a dictionary value that contained one of the random sequences that were previously generated. And with all the major cell types now in the simulation, here's what it looks like so far. Um, it should look familiar because it was in the video, but I'll go over it again. So the CRCs, are seated in the dark zone on the left, and the T cells and FTCs are seated on the light zone on the right. And finally, these B cells are generated throughout the plane towards the center. All the FTCs um, were assigned a predetermined target sequence because they are the antigen presenting cells. And similar to the B cells, this was done by assigning the cells uh, dictionary values, which could be um, referenced later. And to finish initializing the B cells, they were each assigned the same set of parameters, uh, including volume here, um, chemotaxis data, and the Tellurium gene network model. And in order, to, in order to simulate chemotaxis, the chemotaxis plugin was initialized in the XML file. The CXCL13 was secreted by FDCs in the light zone, and CXCL12 was secreted by CRCs in the dark zone. And this basically just meant that the B cells would follow the CXCL12 gradient to go towards the dark zone on the left, and conversely follow the CXCL13 gradient to go towards the light zone on the right. So here on the left, we have the same figure from before with all the cells seated in the correct locations. And the established chemo tracking gradients can be seen on the right. The field on the top is secreted by CRCs and the field on the bottom is secreted by FDCs. You can see that the fields correspond to the locations of the cells shown in the first figure with CXCL12 selected, um, secreted in the dark zone and CXCL13 secreted in the light zone. So tellurium was used to simulate the intracellular molecular network and the mitosis behavior of B cells in the model. And this model would um, should look familiar from the lecture yesterday and from this morning, but obviously this um, screenshot on the right here, it only has the reactions and not the parameters or initial conditions, but it still corresponds with this simplified gene network on the left. Um, we have CXCR4 and CXCR5, controlling the migration of B cells, uh, FOXL1, signaling between the B cells and the FDC, and NF-COPA-B signaling between the B and uh, 
CRC cells. And finally, we have, we have uh, MYC and AP4 controlling B cell proliferation. And all of these correspond to the figure on uh, the left here. So B cells interacting with other cells is very important in order to check for things like antibody affinity and to make decisions on apoptosis or survival, uh, proliferation, et cetera. So using the neighbor tracker plugin, it was determined whether or not the B cell is touching an FTC, a CRC, or a T cell. So in order to, in order to, do, to do this, um, first a list of all the B cells neighbors was retrieved, uh, and then Using the cell type IDs, we can determine whether or not the B cell is touching a certain cell type. So in this case, the, the FDCs have a cell type ID of two. So we just check if two is in the neighbor, um, neighbor list. And if it is, then the B cell is touching an FDC. So now I'm gonna go over what happens when B cells interact, which uh, interact with uh, each specific cell type. So starting with FDCs, the antigen from the FDC is expressed along with the MHC2 antigen um, on the surface of the B cell. And this was done by setting the dictionary value to one. Uh, next, the affinity score of the cell was calculated by comparing the cell's antibody sequence to the antigen sequence retrieved from the FTC. So in order, to, in order to retrieve the sequence, the FTC's cell type ID of two was used again. And then um, finally, the affinity score determines the BCR signaling strength by, down by downregulating FOXL1. And that's the last line right here. Next, um, here's what happens when a B cell touches a T cell. So if the B cell is touching a T cell before contact with an FTC, which is indicated by this um, MHC2 energy value equaling zero, uh, then nothing happens. But if the B cell is touching a, a T cell after contact with an FTC, which is indicated by this MHC2, MHC2 energy value equaling one, then um, the probability of turning off the cell death timer and changing the chemotaxis direction is determined by the affinity score. So a higher affinity score would indicate a higher chance of the cell death timer being turned off and the cell surviving and also returning back to the drug zone. So to change the chemotaxis direction, um, which induced the migration of B cells from the dark zone to the light zone, nf kappa b uh, and CXCR4 are turned on by setting their production rates to 10 and 1, respectively. The B cell death timer was, um, follows a stochastic first order process, and it was initiated by the drop of the NF copper B level to 50 or less. And if the timer reaches zero, then the cell is deleted or undergoes apoptosis. B cell growth is initiated by AP4 when it is greater than 10. And AP4 is activated by MYC, and MYC is activated by nf kappa b After a uh, B cell comes into contact with a CRC in the dark zone, if the AP4 level is still greater than 10, then B 
B-cell growth is initiated by increasing the cell volume following an exponential function seen here. Otherwise, the, um, if the AP4 level is not greater than 10, then the cell just returns to the light zone. So if the B cells grow enough and reach a specific volume of 32 or higher, then the cells undergo mitosis and divide in the mitosis separable, separable class. The parent cells attributes are then, um, are then duplicated to the two daughter cells, essentially cloning the original parent cell. And the B cells also undergo somatic hypermutation in the dark zone. If the B cells affinity score is less than the maximum possible score, which means that the B cells antibody sequence still isn't a perfect match yet with the target sequence, the cell undergoes mutation where a random element of the sequence is selected and randomly changed to a different base. So here, index to change uh, indicates um, it selects a random element to change, and the holder selects a random element to change to. So now I'm going to play the same video of the simulation running as before. And to reiterate, the B cells are going to spawn in the center and move back and forth between the dark and the light zones. In the dark zone on the left, the B cells proliferate and undergo somatic hypermutation. And in the light zone, the B cells either survive or undergo apoptosis based on their affinity score. And so a higher affinity score would indicate that they would probably survive or be more likely to survive and return to the dark zone while a lower affinity score would mean that um, they are more likely to undergo apoptosis. And once again, the color of the B cells indicates the affinity score of their antibody sequence, which means that a higher affinity is indicated by the warmer colors. So a perfect score would, indicate, would be indicated by a cell color of red. Um, and so these green, uh, green cells have a affinity score of uh, two, and so on. And since the simulation uh, hasn't finished yet, the most of the B cells still have a low affinity, though the number of high affinity cells is, is increasing rapidly. And as time goes on, the nearly all of the B cells will have high affinity and they will nearly all be red. You happen to know um, how many simulation steps we may be looking at here? Like, what's the time frame on this? Um, the completed simulation had, uh, so this video represents around uh, 45,000 MCS. And this basically just represents a successful GCR with um, all, nearly all the B cells affinity matured. And now these B cells can differentiate into memory B cells or long lived plasma cells. So, in order to uh, output the data in the simulation for further analysis, output text files were used. 
and they were named in a certain way so that the parent cell and the generation could easily be identified along with the ID of the cell itself. And this was super important because the new files, because new brand new text files were created every time after mitosis, which means that we need to link the cell lineages back together somehow. And the files um, were thus named a, B, a underscore b underscore c dot txt, where a is a cell's generation, b is um, the ID of the mother cell, and c is the ID of the cell itself. And data was stored every 15 MCS, so it wouldn't slow down the simulation that much. And here is just a visual visualization of the cell lineages I was talking about before. So the first row here are the spawn cells, and there were five of them. And taking one cell, for example, 62, um, every time the cell divided, two new cells were created. So for example, cell 62 divided into 74 and 75, and then cell 74 then divided into 84 and 85. And this continued for a maximum of 10 generations, which was when the simulation was terminated because nearly all the cells were high affinity. So in order to um, parse and plot all the data uh, from the simulation, we used a separate Python program outside of CompuCell 3D. So first we took all the text files from CompuCell 3D and export and imported them into the Python program. And then we used a recursive function to find all the possible lineages. So in this case, um, 62, 74, 84, 92, all the way on to 310, that would be one cell lineage. And we compiled all the lineages, so, um, and there were around 130 of them. Next, we selected one lineage and we repurposed the recursive function um, to combine all the files of the lineage into one, which had data from zero MCS all the way to the end of the simulation. And finally, we selected the desired variables that we wanted to plot and we graphed them using matplotlib. And here are those steps in more detail. So, um, Here's a look at the files exported from CC3D. Once again, A is the cell generation. And so for this file right here, one would be the generation. Um, these, five with the, uh, these five files with zeros for generations are the five spawned cells. And then these uh, files below are second generation cells. B is the mother ID. So it would be the ID of the mother cell. For this cell right here, the mother ID is 59. So we know that 59 is uh, the mother cell. And then C is a cell ID. So for this cell, 65 is the ID of the cell. And in total, there were uh, around 267 text files for all the cells. Here is a closer look inside each file. Uh, each file has a header with all the variables. Um, and each new line indicates a uh, change in time. In this case, a new line uh, was made every 15 Monte Carlo steps. And there are a lot of variables. So the file wrapped each line in two, but um, you can see that MCS is the first column. So it goes MCS 0, 15, 30, 45, 60, and um, cell ID is a second, and so on. Uh, next, all of the files were imported into Python and they were accessed using uh, this read file function, which would return a list of all the data in the file. And this was just done using uh, uh, standard Python uh, functions, including read lines and with open. Next, uh, this recurs recursive function, print files, was uh, used to find all the cell lineages. So this function was run on each of the five starter cells down here. And each time the function was called, 
it would find the two daughter cells of um, the cell. And then it would recursively run the function on each daughter cell all the way until a leaf node was found. So this for loop would find all the children, uh, the two children, and this uh, for loop would then run the recursive function, run the function recursively on each of the children. So the function generated around 130 lists of lineages, and here are just some examples. So this first lineage here uh, reached the fifth generation, and um, these here reached the seventh, and uh, these bottom three reached um, the tenth. And once again, the, the generation is the first number in the names. And you can tell that the uh, mother ID of um, each cell corresponds to the uh, cell ID of the previous file in, the, in, in each lineage. So for example, this uh, cell 93 had a mother ID of 84 and the previous cell had a cell ID of 84. So you know that it corresponds uh, to the cell lineage. Next, we repurposed our recursive function to combine the desired lineage. So a variable named files is initialized with a list of all the cells in one lineage. And the recursive function now only considers uh, cells in one lineage that are in this list. So this files has one lineage. And now when finding children, it only considers files in this lineage. And this lineage can be replaced with any other lineage from the uh, example I showed in the previous slide. Now that all the data is compiled, the user must select the desired variables to, to display and analyze. So let's say I chose uh, X position, Y position, and MCS as my three variables. Then the code, the program will create three lists of data for each of the three variables. And that's done on the code to the left. And finally, we are able to generate plots use um, uh, the last step is to graph the data using matplotlib. But before we do that, uh, we must first convert all the data in the lists um, in, from strings into floats. And this is because the Python split function returns a list of strings, which can't be graphed using matplotlib. And because it would just return like a bunch of nonsense if we don't convert them to numbers. So here we first need to convert the data from strings into integers. And then we can plot them using matplotlib. So using this code, we can now generate plots using our data. Um, on the left in figure A, we have the trajectory of a single B cell lineage where the location of the B cell is depicted uh, similar to a Cartesian plane with X and Y position. And the change in the color indicates the change in time or MCS. And using the color bar here on the right, 
we can see that as time progresses, the color of the dots get lighter. So it starts down here and the cell moves back and forth and ends up uh, here. Figure B is similar, but it instead depicts the change in CXCR4 level as time goes on. So the CXCR4 level increases as the B cell is heading towards the dark zone, um, which makes sense because it is supposed to follow the, the chemotrafting gradient CXCL12. Figures A and B on the slide are of the same format as figure B from last slide, but um, this time they depict Mick and Fox at one. And if you look carefully, it is pretty clear that Fox at one inhibits Mick uh, because as, uh, as Fox at one increases, Mick uh, decreases. And this corresponds to our gene network, which I have copied and pasted below. And then figure C here on the right depicts the cell generation. And the change in the colors is where the B cell undergoes mitosis. And these color changes, they all happen uh, here, 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 here. And these are all in the dark zone to the left, which also makes sense. Finally, this slide depicts the overall change in antibody affinity. So at the start of the simulation, there were a small number of low affinity cells. Um, and by the end, there were many cells and nearly all of them were high affinity. And these are just graphs which um, represent the same data as the screenshots to the left. So we can see the antibody affinity increases over time and so do the number of cells. And at zero steps, uh, there were no um, cells with perfect uh, affinity, but uh, at the end of the simulation, nearly all the cells had um, perfect scores in terms of affinity. And there were also uh, a dramatic increase in the number of cells. So studies show that the GCR is suppressed by dioxin, which is observed in mice. And um, that can also be observed here in the reduction of uh, antibody affinity and total B cell numbers when B cell clonal expansion rate is reduced. And in this case, um, B cell clonal expansion was decreased by one third. And it can be seen that the GCR is um, suppressed pretty dramatically. So for one, there are less cells at the end of the simulation. And also the, um, there, is, there are way more low affinity cells compared to um, the normal simulation. So just as a quick summary, 
Uh, this preliminary CC3D model qualitatively sums up the key events of GCR. And uh, future iteration is needed to improve the model so that we can better understand and predict the adverse outcomes of immune suppressing chemicals. So I think, so that was great. Thank you, Derek. Um, we do have an exercise here, it looks like, but I think we should probably take a couple of minutes here for questions on the, the model itself, I guess, before we move into exercises. Um, I've got a couple, but I'd like to open the floor up to others first before we, or before I ask mine. Give people a minute in case they're typing into the chat. So maybe while other people are thinking or maybe typing in a question, I guess so. If you go to slide 30 or just anywhere where an image of the simulation is shown, this is kind of a a minor question, but the so the CRC on the left and the FTC on the right, the positioning of that is that based on anything in particular, or is it just a random arrangement? Like the positioning in each of the zones, or like the the positioning of the fixed blocks of CRC and and FTC, unless I'm misinterpreting that, what the the fixed squares are essentially. Uh. So like the positioning of the cells, like um, it was just like according to the histology, like the zones are shaped this way. So that's just okay. how we position the cells. Yeah. All right, so it's taken from literature. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was just curious if it was based on experimental observation or if it was just randomly selected, so. Um, I guess my other question then is, about practical implications. So we understand the mechanism now. What are maybe a couple of practical applications for this as you move forward with the, the model that you can think of? And you talked a little bit in the beginning about why it's important to understand it. But... Yeah, I mean, like this example in the end is just saying like uh, how environmental chemicals can like disrupt the GCR. And so if we take, um, uh, viruses like COVID, for example, if we can better understand how to uh, most effectively like uh, promote the GCR, then that obviously would uh, lead to more effective antibody creation and help our bodies better deal with these viruses. And that, I guess, is like the biggest um, uh, application I can think of. Right. So the idea is that this would be used more as like a test bed for testing the effects of different chemical treatments on various viruses yeah. moving forward. So this is like a more general platform rather than a specific um, instance of a viral treatment that you're looking at. So cool, any other questions? We do have an exercise here on how to use the Python export. It should definitely be useful because that is something that you can do in CompuCell, but it's not super straightforward. Um, so if there's not any immediate questions, I guess we'll let Derek move on to the exercise. I put the link, I know a couple people came in a couple minutes late, so I'll repost it in the chat in case you missed it. Um, there's a link to Google Drive here where I've uploaded the code for the exercises. Um, you can go grab those there. And if you have any other questions along the way about the model or about the biology, feel free to put them in the chat and we can address them as we go. Um, so yeah, Derek, if you want to go ahead and get started and you can just explain what we'll be doing in the exercise while people are grabbing the, the code. Yep. Let me just be sure.
So these exercises are pretty, um, are just gonna be pretty specific in uh, how to plot uh, the model exports. So, If I open the Python code here, can everyone see the Python code? Cool. If I run it, I should be prompted with a uh, menu to choose the variables. And here um, I can just choose three variables, X, Y, and Z to plot. So if I just choose something like uh, X position, Y position, and the MCS, I should be able to see my code visualize, my uh, inputs visualized in this uh, mygraphs.png image. And here with the X position, Y position, and the MCS. I just want to mention, I really like those time plots with the color changing over time. Those are very interesting to look at. Um, is there a sample data set in the exercise folder? Yeah, it should come with a folder okay. with uh, solid data. Right. Yeah, so people just want to give a try visualizing a couple different things. Um, Maybe we can have them run a few different visualizations and have people share what they're finding unless you had something else in mind. Um, so this actually would coincide pretty well with TJ's talk that he's giving today on how to use other Python programs to call CompuCell. Um, although I think this one might just be, a, is this just a straight up Python script? Does this call CompuCell at any point? Do you know? This is just based on the data, right? Once you get the data. Yeah, it's just Python. Yeah, it is conceivable if you would use, you know, what TJ was teaching today. So if you're interested in this, you can always watch this session later um, to have like one script that would actually run the simulation for you, generate the data and plot it all at once. So you can just run one script and, you know, and let it go because sometimes these things take a while to run. Um, so there you can do some kind of that kind of automation. Um, in this case, though, like Derek said, this is just a Python script running on a pre-exported data set. So I'll let you take back over, Derek. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, so just try for yourself and um, choose any of the variables from this menu. Uh, just make sure that the capitalization is correct. And after you run it, you should be able to see your um, mygraphs.png update with uh, a new graph each time. Has anybody been able to run this and found an interesting plot that they might want to show? I won't ask you to interpret it, don't worry. Give people another minute or two. Any questions about the code? Was everybody at least able to find the folder? Is this link working? You just give a thumbs up or a show of hands if if the link is working. Okay, great. And so this code is obviously tailored to um, Derek's particular use case, but the idea here is that this would actually be fairly easy to adapt to any given data set that you're generating out of, of CompuCell. Because um, the main idea here is being able to just pick three variables and have it auto-generate the plots. Um, which like I was saying is something that is not 
super easy to do straight out of CompuCell. Okay, so is anybody else doing the exercise? Is everybody able to get it to run at least? You don't have to share necessarily, but you can just give me a thumbs up again in the participant panel if the, the code is running for you. Actually, no, I didn't think about this, but maybe people don't have, okay. It just occurred to me. We've been working in NanoHub, so people may not actually have Python installed. Um, yeah. It just occurs to me. Okay, so that's something that we'll have to probably work up a tutorial then. Um, if so, the desktop version of CompuCell does automatically install Python for you. So if you do install the desktop version of CompuCell after the workshop, you'll be able to run this code. Um, I have idle, but can't get NumPy installed on it. NumPy should be built in at this point. Um, I believe you need to go into your terminal, and I'm pretty sure uh, it's pip3 install NumPy hmm. to yeah. install NumPy. So I'll put that in the chat. I know some some versions. If you get Python through Anaconda, for example, will install a lot of that stuff automatically for you. Um, are you in a Windows machine, JD521? So. Yeah, I'm used to working in Linux with Python. Not so much with command line <clears throat> in Windows. And yeah, because it fights you at every turn. But, um, so JD521, we'll follow up with you later about that. Is anybody else having trouble getting NumPy installed or was able to run the code? Actually, JD521, if you could direct message me your, your name, because we're because of the issue with the chat rooms, um, we have different usernames here. So I just so I know who to follow up with afterwards. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, this is something we should probably go over um, at least with some sort of tutorial document before the hackathon, how to get a full Python install ready if you're not using desktop CompuCell. It's one of these things that doesn't occur to you if you've already got Python installed for years. <laughs> it's like it just came with my computer, right? But, okay, so I think that that sounds good. Were there any other last comments or remarks you wanted to make, Derek, before we go? Any other last questions from anybody? Mm, I did have... Uh two other exercises, but oh, okay. yeah, sure. like, I guess I'll just go over them quickly since I'm not sure if everyone's able to run them on their computers. Okay. So the second one is just changing the cell lineage. So we have one lineage here and I can select any other lineage that I have generated and cell lineages in this text file. So I'll just copy any random, copy this one, for example. And then I can replace uh, this lineage with my new lineage. And if I run it now, it should generate a different graph. So same variables. And now it's a different graph for the same variables. It's still X and Y position and uh, MCS, but uh, the graph is uh, significantly different. So this cell, I guess, it started here 
then move back and forth, ended up uh, up here. And my funnel. Um, Oops, sorry, real quick. Um, Adonaska makes a good point. Can we run the Pi file with Jupyter on NanoHive? Yes, you should be able to. Um, but you may need to do some copying and pasting into cells in in your Python notebook. Um, again, we can, you know, we're running up on about our time limit here. If we have a little bit of extra time, we can look at that. Um, but we'll follow up with you about that afterwards as well. So make sure that everybody can run these. Yeah. The last exercise is just plotting, um, changing our 2D plot to 3D because we have three variables anyways. So we just need to change a, a few lines of code. So I replace this with um, a 3D projection. Then it's now a 3D graph. Uh, not very useful, I guess, but it's pretty fun to look at. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you mind going back to that code real quick? Did you, most of that line is self explanatory. Could you explain very quickly what the C map equals Veritas is? Yeah, the C map familiar? is just like uh, the coloring. So, um, yeah. Um, so if you want to mess with different color palettes, you can look into the CMAP function and it'll give you different options for that. Yeah. And okay. that's it. I would like to acknowledge my mentor, Dr. Zhang, for um, his help. And that's all I have. Thank you everyone for listening. Great, thank you again. And so Derek is, also attending the workshop this week. You may have seen him in the participant list. Um, so if you would like to follow up with him about any of this over the next day or so, um, feel free to reach out. Are you participating in the hackathon, Derek? No, no. Okay. Um, okay, so if there are no other questions, I guess we can go ahead and leave. And remember, we are gonna reconnect to the main meeting at 4.30. Um, because we have our 15 minute break built in between this presentation and the next one. So I will see you back in the main workshop. Does everybody still have a link for that? I send it out every day, so I hope so. Um, if not, just let me know. So we'll see you back in the main meeting at 4.30 for our last session of the day. Thanks again, Derek, it was great. See you.